Good. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us on this lovely Wednesday morning. Um, so, um, this is session 49, Publishing Power. Um, I hope you all intend to be um, in this room. So, I'm Lisa Lodrick, and this is Zina Kamesh. Um, so, we're really excited to welcome you here to talk about a wide range of kind of power inequalities and current issues in publishing in archaeology. And part of why we're, I guess, interested in this is that we both have editorial roles in archaeology that we should be open about. So, um, morning, Misha, it's fine. Um, so, um, I edit a open access journal published by um, the Open Library of Humanities, and I'm on the board of Britannia, which is a a, Rom a Romano-British <laughs> journal. Uh, I'm deputy editor of the European Journal of Archaeology. Um, according to someone whose paper I rejected this week, I'm also part of the Archaeo Mafia, uh, which seems <laughs> relevant to today, where we're talking about kind of gatekeeping and power for that person. You are such a I'm an evil <laughs> gatekeeper, um, and I also sit on the ICS Publications Committee as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got six lovely um, papers lined up. Um, so we're going to have around 15 minutes full of papers and then immediate questions directed to the paper after each talk. But then we've got plenty of time for discussion later. So we've got a panel of um, a range of editors and publishers and authors. And then we're really keen to throw out questions to the audience. So please kind of keep your questions in mind. So just by means of kind of an initial, I guess, introduction and way to get ideas and debates flowing, We've compiled the top 10 <laughs> power inequalities in publishing. We can discuss whether these we are the right 10 in the panel. <laughs> you may disagree um, with that. Yeah, so we're just going to quickly run through these just to kind of raise some of the, you know, current issues, which at least we feel are pertinent. So number one. Uh, so choice of publication venue. So how do you make these choices or in some cases, how are they made for you? So to some extent, we're kind of pushed into particular directions by things like the ref, um, particularly towards um, journal articles, books, um, whether those then become double weighted um, uh, and issues like that uh, that also link in with the um, uh, open access agenda, which I'm sure we will talk lots about uh, today. Uh, then related to that kind of issues around access to what might consider themselves to be prestige uh, journals, uh, so places like Nature or Antiquity or the Journal of Roman Archaeology, and I should say as a Roman archaeologist I do not have uh, an article in the Journal of Roman Archaeology, um, and all the kind of questions that go through people's heads when they're thinking about where they're going to put a paper, um, are they good enough, to, you know, are they to, you know, do they have the confidence to go for these big ones, uh, is their work exciting enough, uh, is it in some cases traditional within that particular kind of journal's sphere? Um, and sometimes we can talk ourselves out then of um, putting in for particular journals because we think we don't meet those uh, criteria. Um, and then another major kind of power imbalance is who has access to publications that archaeologists are putting out there. So both in terms of you know physical books and libraries, but also digitally, so it's you know, a widely accepted problem of tables and that many journal articles published by many journals are behind pay limits so that you can only access them if you're belonging to a subscribing institution like a university, um, if you're digitally literate and can use a computer, um, or if you want to spend £20 for a PDF, which is quite cheap for this one. Um, and in many, in many cases, we're taking research you know, based on developer-funded archaeology and then putting the outputs in somewhere that people working for developer-funded units can't access. And there's ways round this, but all of them are, have pros and cons, I guess you could say. And then the next big power inequality is if you're like, hey, I'm going to get round this system and I'm going to pay an article processing charge and get a lovely open access article. The thing is, in many journals, these cost money. So, um, you know, up to £3,000 for some journals. Um, some people in universities will have funding for this. Some people won't. There are lots of um, low-cost APC or no APC options available. But whether you're kind of able to use those options 
partly depends on kind of your place in the system and how much power you have over your own decisions. Copyright, which is another big <laughs> power inequality. So essentially, <coughs> what we all do, we send our work to journals, we get sent one of these blurry copyright forms, we don't really read it, we just say yes because we want our paper to come out as soon as possible. And then essentially, you no longer own the copyright to your work in many cases. There are options around this, such as Creative Commons licensing, or we moves towards um, the UK Scholarly Communications um, license, which is kind of like in development. But um, it's a big problem in terms of how you can use your own work in the future. Number six. Uh, so reviewer number two, I think we're all aware of the issues around reviewer number two, um, but some of the um, issues involve yelling in capitals um, uh, at uh, sometimes, you know, the, the young person, the first time they've ever tried, it can really put people off publishing. Um, indeed, actually, this was a book review, but a, a friend of mine nearly left academia because of a nasty review. So these things really matter and people throw their weight around often because they're anonymous. Um, uh, and they can get away with a bit of bullying that way. Um, but there are um, kind of other ways around it. Um, uh, so open peer review is one of those. So um, some um, uh, kind of interesting um, new journals like FYSN, uh, where the reviews are published alongside uh, the, the papers themselves. And I think that can discourage some of the um, uh, yelling um, aspects. Authorship, does that mean as well? Mm -hmm. um, so, who actually, whose voices are we hearing in our um, publications? Um, uh, and uh, quite a lot of work now has been done around gender issues uh, and the fact that women's voices in particular uh, are not being heard. Uh, so, this is some of Lisa's data on. Um, authors in uh, books about the Roman economy, and you can see it really is pretty poor. Uh, the one uh, where there's a slightly better uh, representation, Wilson Floor 2016, a deliberate effort was made uh, to make sure that there was a gender balance. So it is possible, you know, there, there are 50% women in the world, um, and uh, we can be in publishing. Um, the data for um, uh, BAME, or Scholars of Colour, um, is much more difficult to find and people haven't done so many studies on that. There are some in classics, but uh, if it's bad for gender, it gets even worse um, when you start adding in um, some other factors as well. Um, then uh, moving on to, what am I on? Uh, same thing. So this is just some of the data that's been gathered for uh, Journal of Roman Studies and for Britannia. Um, again, you can see that there are some really quite big problems here. Um, what is interesting for something like the JRS um, uh, study um, is that it, these problems go right back to submission. Women are not putting papers forward and therefore they're not being published. So we need to work out those reasons why women are not submitting papers to these journals. Is this also me? Mm. Uh, so on to um, editorial boards, there's a bit of mystery here, how do you get onto an editorial board, who makes those choices, what do those editorial boards look like? Uh, again, there are some um, gender disparities here, some are doing a little bit uh, better than others. Uh, I'm glad to say that the, <laughs> the one I sit on, the European Journal of Archaeology, has really quite a decent gender uh, balance, in fact, uh, more women than men, but that might also be because the editor and the deputy editor, which is me, are both women. Um, so, you know, maybe we're um, kind of encouraging uh, people in a particular uh, direction. Uh, but that's all very mysterious how these things happen. Um, and then the next one is, you know, canonization, who gets to decide what pieces of scholarship become the key pieces in, you know, future discussions of archaeology. So, for instance, in Roman archaeology, this book by David Mattingly is like the absolute new orthodoxy, I think, across all courses that I know of in the UK and probably beyond. Um, it has it gets hugely cited as like the standard. What happens? It's got a free score of three point seven five on Goodreads. I mean, most things are never on there. It's hugely bought by librarians. But who's deciding that this is so good and so important? 
I mean, it is useful. And then the final point, which I think is becoming increasingly um, discussed in academia, is this kind of concept of reproducibility. So actually, who, to how much power does the author kind of retain over future work using their material? So um, there's been a few studies now looking at, for instance, are authors making their data available within their publications? Um, about 50% aren't in the kind of review of several journals, which means that the author can then kind of perhaps control who they collaborate in the future, who can access that data, and who can access kind of future collaborations in the field. And then just to wrap up, why are we talking about this now on a Wednesday morning? <laughs> so there's, a, I guess, two key points. One is the kind of ongoing discussions over major issues of precarity and overwork and promotion inequality within universities, which are all tied into to REF and how we assess, you know, um, what's the word? Work. Um, you know, how important are individual journals? How much do we need to publish? And like the constant push to do more and to do better feeds into all of these issues. And the second problem is that we're currently um, waiting for a UK RI open access review, which is going to show how this thing called Plan S is going to be implemented, which is going to have major um, impacts on how publishing works, or is it?